Is the war between Russia and Ukraine entering the end game stage to where the end is now coming within physical range, visible, visible range where you can see it coming? I think that the answer is just probably pretty clear already. We have nobody better to discuss this today than Colonel Doug McGregor, combat veteran, highly decorated uh, CEO of Our Country, Our Choice. Doug, always a pleasure to have you on board. Hey, thanks, Dan. Well, look, let's just jump right into it here because there's we got a lot to cover today, and this is going to be a, a packed one here. And we're really eager to to get your observations on some of these things. Uh, and, and in terms of is it coming to the end game, you, you see a lot in the United States. And we're going to talk about this in a second, especially among our leaders, uh, and that, that goes with the the U.S. administration, NATO, and Ukraine. They're all still talking about, hey, we're going to hold for 2024 build up for capacity. And then in 2025, we're going to go back on the offensive. And that's almost like a given. Everybody expects that. Yeah. I mean, as long as we want, we'll just be able to maintain the current status quo for the rest of this year. But when you look at evidence on the ground, I'm not sure that that's a very safe assumption to make. And as we're also going to see here in a moment, a lot of the assumptions that is that NATO has already made have been disastrously wrong. Uh, it, what you're seeing on the screen right there is, is a number of of just some of the more recent attacks that Russia has been making on their long range missile strikes across the entire country of Ukraine. And the, the air defense uh, of the country uh, has just almost been knocked out and, and they're increasingly incapable of stopping. And Russia has now upped their anti-energy uh, system strikes much more effective than they ever had in the past. And, and we've seen here in just recent days that uh, Ukraine is running out of ammo, they're running out of men. They're running out of equipment. They're running out of logistics and maintenance capacity, which is much more important than some people have uh, understand. Russia is doing the exact opposite. They're increasing their manpower. They're increasing their ammunition stockpiles. Their uh, uh, industrial capacity continues to advance. I mean, everything that builds national combat power is moving in opposite directions here. Um, and then now that we also have here in just recent days, uh, all along the front line, there's at least five different spots where Russia has been having a creeping offensive that is now starting to be more than just creeping. And at least in four of those five areas, they're making methodical and significant progress up in there. Now then, in just about the last 24 hours or so, uh, the, the large city in the north in Kharkiv, a lot of people are starting to evacuate. You see these videos here where there's large numbers of people, you know, just streaming out of the city, heading to the south. Uh, and uh, the military summary channel talked about some of the details today of exactly what's going on there. Of course, there are a few reasons of that, and the most important one is that during the previous weeks, the Russians destroyed the Kharkiv power plants. Uh, this is the first Kharkiv power plant number five that was destroyed during the during the march. The second uh, power plant was destroyed in the vicinity of the city by the name of Slabazhanskaya. This is Miivska power plant, and there were few lots of days in a row uh, when we have uh, complete blackouts in the area. But even uh, the absence of electricity is also not the most important reason why the Ukrainians decided to leave Kharkiv. The most important one is this video. If you take a look at this video, you're going to see uh, of how the Russians were bombing and attacking Kharkiv with FAP 1500 and FAP 500. So this is the main reason why the Ukrainians decided to leave and abandon Kharkiv completely. So, Doug, really everywhere you look, things seem to be picking up pace uh, on the Russian side. The, the danger seem to be growing for the Ukraine side. And as you see these, especially these more targeted and much more effective than the last, than a year ago when Russia had tried to hit a lot of the energy infrastructure, these seem to be having a much bigger impact. What is the uh, objective here of Russia and are we entering the end game? <clears throat> yes, Dan, this, this is very definitely the end game. What we've seen in the past was very deliberate and incremental because there was always the hope in Moscow that they would have a negotiating partner in the West, whether it was uh, European or American or preferably both. Uh, they, I think the Moscow leadership truly believed that if they moved deliberately and cautiously, they would find somebody to talk to. That That has been completely abandoned now. I think the Russians know there's, there's no end other than the one they make of it. And so what we're seeing is the ramp up in long-range precision strikes. 
against the entire power grid, the energy sources, the energy delivery systems, transportation, uh, arsenals, ammunitions, uh, all of those things are, are being systematically targeted. And, and the reason is very simple. Once you've uh, stripped it away uh, and uh, eliminated all of the air defense and the energy, two things happen. First of all, the population says, I can't survive here, and they leave. And the Russians would like the civilian population to get out of these places. They do not want to fight their way through cities that are full of people. And then secondly, uh, they don't want to have to deal with threats to their own forces from above. Top attack. Top attack has proven to be the decisive development in uh, the revolution in military affairs, if you want to call it that, uh, at every level, tactical, operational, and strategic. So now, um, what do you think Russia's attempts are, or what there's their what is their hopes in Kharkiv? Because I mean, we've seen we, Bakhmut. It took them nine months to take that relatively small villa, a city, uh, Avdivka, another five to six months, relatively speaking, especially in the in the latter phases of it. And now they're going to, for example, Chasavyar, uh, which is kind of the next uh, operational objective, and it's it's very slow. But Kharkiv is, is a huge city. And does Russia even have the manpower, do you think, to go after that at the same time they're trying to keep these other ones going? Oh, undoubtedly, they have more than enough manpower. But again, as I said earlier, ensuring that the population gets out makes it that much easier for them. Remember that Kharkov as well as Odessa are both historically Russian cities. And in the fall of 2023, it was made very clear as it had been, frankly, since the fall of 2022, that those cities would once again be Russian. So let there be no, no mistake, those cities will be back under Russian control. And this is one of the reasons that Ray McGovern and others who know the Russians well have urged us repeatedly to negotiate with them in order to try and minimize the amount of territory and industrial base and urban areas that the Ukrainians would have to lose as a result of a settlement. Well, th those times are over, and I think the Russians have decided to be done with it. So, no, they have enough forces. I don't think that's the issue for them. Uh, they, they will not attack Odessa immediately. I think you're going to see more action further north and uh, about north and northeast of Odessa before they turn decisively on Odessa. In the meantime, of course, the Ukrainians are trying to turn Kiev itself into Stalingrad. And as we all know, that's the last place the Russians really want to go. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, they would like to avoid that altogether. And they still want a government to talk to. The problem for the Russians at this point, and you know this very well, there's not there's not much of a government left. And the military structure is crumbling. The, the senior leadership is no right. longer where it was. Uh, there's and The population has had it. I mean, if you look at the unofficial private polls that are being conducted in Western Ukraine, in other words, west of the Emperor River, everybody wants an end to this. So the, the Ukrainians are really on their last legs. And that's why sending any money over there over there at this point, other than humanitarian aid, makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Now I've seen uh, some. There's been lots of reports in the in the Western press here uh, in the last few weeks or so that uh, Ukraine belatedly started digging lots of fortifications in the Zaporizhia area, along where a lot of these main attacks have been going on. But according to some satellite images I saw actually uh, earlier this morning, they are very much behind the scale up in the northern area, in the Sumy area, in the Kharkiv area. So if Russia does want to come in from the north, they would have a lot less difficult time breaking through fortifications than they would down the line of contact. And it doesn't appear that Ukraine has enough forces or reserves to be able to handle both of those at the same time. No, I, I think that's true. And remember something else, that all of these long-range strikes are preparatory. Preparatory in the sense that until mid to late April, the ground is not going to be firm enough to really withstand the beating that it's going to take from the heavy armored forces that the Russians are going to send in. So they, they've got to have firm ground. I mean, this could be delayed. The, the major assault could actually be delayed until May. I don't know what the current weather is like, but they've had a lot of snow and rain. That makes it very hard to move. So these are preparatory strikes so that when the, the string is pulled, so to say, on the larger offensives, there won't be anything out there to stop them. And then finally, Remember the defenses that gave them the most trouble that you were mentioning were in the Donets or the uh, Donets Basin. Uh, 
and the reason for that is very clear. The Ukrainians had spent years pouring concrete and installing weapons platforms. This is not the case now. They've fallen behind their last defenses, if you will. The hasty defenses aren't going to work. They're not continuous. There are too many holes. So it's very easy to outflank them, move around them, isolate them, and destroy them. And then again, I think more and more Ukrainians are throwing in the towel. The problem for them, of course, is the SBU, the secret police, that is shooting large numbers of people behind the lines. Now, let me ask you this question. Uh, aside from the, the tactics or, you know, whether they're coming in from the north, the south, whatever, uh, there is also this issue of, of an army breaking. We had uh, Chess Freeman on a couple of weeks back ago that, uh, and, and several other people, John Mearsheimer, they think that, that there's probably the bigger risk for the Ukraine side is that the army would eventually break, which seems kind of like what you might be talking about here. Not that any particular defense may, may be penetrated or so, but that the defense itself may be break. Can, how do you see that part? Uh, what, what are the risks of that? Oh, I think the risk is very, very high. There's no question about it. You, you can't evacuate the wounded in time to save anybody's life. Just imagine that. Imagine that you're a Ukrainian soldier and, and you're in contact with the Russians and you know that if you're shot to pieces, that you're probably never going to reach a doctor until you're dead. What does that do to your morale? How do you feel about that? I mean, one of the things we always did very well historically in the United States military and the army especially is evacuate wounded and keep as many people as uh, alive as possible. They can't do that. They don't have the means to do it. Uh, and by the way, for those in, in the U.S. military that are watching, I hope they're paying attention to the absence of rotor-driven aircraft on the battlefield. You can't just fly in in a helicopter, pick people up with impunity, and fly them out. Those yeah. days are over. So the, the bottom line is the infrastructure of warfare, the logistics, which include medical evacuation and medical support, those things are almost gone on the Ukrainian side. And you cannot sustain operations for very long. And you can only threaten people with shooting so many times until they finally say, the hell with it, we're leaving. We've had it. Right. Yeah. And of course, nobody knows where that point could come. I don't even think that well, the people themselves probably don't. But I think that historically, anyway, when it happens, it's suddenly a significant break. And then it just expands like a virus uh, throughout the force here. But now there's one other interesting aspect of this, Doug, that all the things that you're laying out here are objective realities, things that you can look on the ground, you could see from the sky, you can count, uh, you can observe the uh, operations. Those are one thing here. But what complicates this for the West, especially, is this continued and, and I think very dangerous procli uh, proclivity to just not see the, any of the truth and to just pretend that things are the way we want them to be. And that one of the most <laughs> shocking and disturbing recent examples of this, and unfortunately there's a lot, is from uh, Admiral Bauer from the NATO, who was in an interview, I think, with DW a couple of days ago. Uh, he was asked by the reporter, and, and watch how she asked this question, because she's kind of like going, yeah, what you're saying is not making sense. She's saying, can Ukraine still win this? As I understand, Ukraine uh, wants to achieve this uh, uh, status, quo, status quo of 1991. Uh, as far as I have understood so far, and, and I haven't heard anything else, is that Ukraine wants to uh, regain all the territory within its legal borders. This and is I 1991. Think, and that is, of course, a, uh, that is a, uh, <laughs> that is, that is a, that is an understandable uh, uh, wish of, of Ukraine. So it's possible. I think it is possible, but uh, it won't be easy. And it might take uh, uh, more time than uh, a lot of people uh, want. Now, what, what he didn't realize, Doug, is that elsewhere in that same uh, interview, he threw himself under the bus by saying that uh, prior to the uh, summer offensive of last year, uh, well, check out what he says here. Do you think that Ukraine has still an opportunity and possibility? There isn't a possibility for Ukraine to win. Yes. Uh, and I think we have been overly optimistic in 2023 when we supported uh, uh, the uh, the efforts of uh, Ukraine with regard to the counteroffensive in the in the summer, early sp in the spring, early summer, and um, and we have done that with uh, we as not NATO but uh, the 15 nations that support Ukraine have done that through uh, uh, weapon systems, ammunition, training of uh, Ukrainian soldier in, uh, in in a lot of nations. Um, 
developing the, the military plans and things like that. So that was done. And then, uh, as with many things in our societies, people think if you, if you plan for it, if you, if you, then it will be successful. The, that last part was amazing. He actually said, well, I mean, if you just plan for it, then it's going to be successful. And maybe we were a little overly optimistic in 2023. And yet, Doug, prior to that offensive, you were screaming from the rafters that there was no chance. There was never a chance. But NATO seems to be thinking, no, there was a chance. Then it played out, and now they're still just in la-la land. Well, you know from your own experience in the United States Army that there is this American mentality that appears to have been successfully uh, inculcated into the minds of Europeans that if you plan something, it will happen. Yeah, you, you and I have seen this. Here's the plan. We've done all the work on the plan. The plan is excellent. Therefore, we will be successful. We all know that nothing survives contact with the enemy, but this is even worse. We, the NATO leadership is reminiscent of the French military leadership in 1940. They continued to draw what they called halt lines on the map across northern France, only to discover that the Germans had already bypassed the area where they had drawn a halt line, and their plans to then move forces forward and dig them in and deliberately defend something had become impossible. I think that's where NATO is. So NATO isn't going to believe this until the, the Russians actually close up on the river, uh, take everything all the way up to Kharkov, and then ultimately turn south on Odessa. At that point, I think they'll begin to come to terms with reality. The problem, Dan, is that there are people who are still talking about sending small numbers of NATO forces, French, uh, Baltic forces, Polish forces. Even now, foolishly, the Finns have said they would send some troops uh, that miraculously are going to cross southern Ukraine uh, in order to reach Odessa and mount some sort of defense of Odessa. They don't seem to understand that as soon as they cross into Ukraine, they're going to be attacked. The Russians can see them, the Russians can target them, the Russians can destroy them. Th this war is over. And the longer that we insist on postponing it, the more Ukrainians will needlessly die, and the longer it will take for this part of the world to recover. And and so one of the other things I, I'd seen actually on that same subject there uh, by some Polish sources, not not anybody disinformation, but claiming that Poland is actually thinking of sending a number of divisions potentially into the western part of Ukraine to uh, defend their brothers if mm -hmm. Russia does break through in some of these areas, whether it's Kharkiv or Odessa, uh, that would seem to be pretty pretty risk uh, or escalatory. Well, when we say the Poles are thinking, remember they had this man, Donald Tusk, who is currently running the show, who is a creature of the European Union. The majority of the Polish uh, population does not share his enthusiasm for that. Support for the war in Ukraine has sort of precipitously fallen to the point where it's now less than 30% of serious support. And if you ask the question, should we send Polish troops in there, I, I doubt that you would get 30% to support it. So I think these people are essentially hot air. I don't think they should be taken seriously. I, I don't see the Finns organizing, mounting up to move thousands of troops all the way down to Odessa near the border with uh, you know Romania. I, I think we're going to listen to lots of silly nonsense and, and as, as we get closer and closer to the end game. And the end game will happen when it becomes clear that Odessa and Kharkov and most of eastern Ukraine are in Russian hands. And then, of course, it's back to the question, can the Russians find someone to talk to? That will depend on changes in government in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. If the governments don't change, the Russians may finally conclude they have no choice but to continue further west. Now, one of the other things that uh, that Bauer said in that interview, which which many in the West are really clinging to, is that, you know, hang on, because F-16s are about to ride to the rescue. The problem with the F-16s is uh, it is, or the challenge with the F-16s is that it is a very different weapon system than the MiGs. It requires not only the training of pilots and mechanics, but it also requires a logistic chain of sufficient uh, spare parts of weapons for the F-16s, for all these things to make it a success. So if you, if you start flying with the F-16s and you have the pilots and the mechanics and the spare parts, you want to make sure that for a prolonged time, Ukraine can use these 
planes very heavily in terms of many, many flight hours will be flown. Very heavily, as long as there's no any aircraft defense. But ironically, in, in a rare moment of, of saying something that's honest, and actually uh, Mark Milley, when he was still the chairman, uh, I have taken a lot of issues with him, but there was a few things he said that were pretty good. This is one of them when he called out, here's the deal on the F-16s. If you look at F-16s, 10 F-16s is a billion dollars. You add the sustainment cost, another billion dollars. So you're talking about $2 billion for 10 aircraft. Uh, the Russians have 1,000. Uh, fourth and fifth generation fighters. So if you're going to contest Russia in the air, you're going to need a substantial amount of fourth and fifth generation fighters. And yet you, you still see there's Bauer, one of the leaders of the NATO, still talking like, yep, we're going to get these things. And these F-16s are going to be a bunch of them. They're going to fly a lot. What do you say to that, Doug? None of them want to admit to the truth. And the truth is that Russian air and missile defenses are among the very best in the world, if not the best. They are very dense, and one of the reasons the ground offensive proceeds slowly is to keep up with the requirement to defend the ground forces against exactly the threat that's being described with the F-16. Uh, if we send aircraft over there, most of them will be shot down. That's the simple truth. Now, the Russians, or at the time, the Soviets, confronted a similar situation during the Korean War. They solved the problem by putting Russian pilots into MiGs. Uh, my greatest concern has always been that when it becomes clear that the Ukrainians are not going to be able to master this and we start to lose aircraft, that someone will say, well, let's put Americans and Dutchmen and Germans and, and others into these aircraft. I think that would be a very serious mistake. We're, we've always been on the edge of becoming a co-belligerent. That would make us a direct participant. Right. And Russia has, uh, Putin has said uh, on February 29th, I think it was, uh, when, when Macron was first talking a lot about, you know, whether they might send French troops into there, he was very emphatic as saying anybody enters the territory of Ukraine, uh, they're legitimate targets. He's also said about the F-16, if it flies from a NATO country, if it takes off and then attacks in here, that airfield will become a legitimate target. So all these things could escalate the war. So it seems on every level of rational, logical, reasonable thinking that it is in America's interest, it's even in Ukraine's interest, to find a negotiated settlement to this. But Matt Miller, just a few days ago, when he was asked, would we consider having any kind of discussions with Russia, said this. We are not going to boost our security uh, or boost any security agreements or start any security agreements with the government of Russia, a government that we have seen invade one of its neighbors uh, unprovoked, kill thousands and thousands of people for no reason at all, except for to pursue the personal conquest objectives of the Russian president. So, no, we will not be taking that. Yeah, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to talk. So we're going to, I guess, continue to say, nope, the, we're going to succeed in here. These F-16s are riding to the rescue or the 2025, ignoring all the things you say. What are the well, possibilities? Remember, yeah, yeah. But remember, Dan, everything he said is based on a lie. And that's the problem we have in the West. The lie is this was an unprovoked invasion. That's absolutely false. You've had on Professor Mearsheimer and others that have talked at length about this. We cultivated this conflict. We encouraged it. And then ultimately, we unleashed it. It was not the Russians who sought this confrontation with us at all. In fact, from the very beginning, the Russians have tried everything they possibly could to avoid a confrontation with the West. Putin has recently said that provided uh, these F-16s go into Ukraine and fly from Ukrainian bases, he absolutely, under no circumstances, will permit the attack of any bases inside the NATO alliance. He doesn't want a confrontation. We're the ones provoking it. But this man's position that he outlined is not sustainable. It cannot go on much longer. And what is going to happen if we continue on? What, what do you think the possibilities are that either Russia does break through and then now that it's, it's no longer an issue of are we going to make a deal, but it's like terms of surrender or, or they can continue to lose cities or that we finally acknowledge this, the lies. And, and, and actually, let me ask you that. Let me ask you a separate question. Let's agree. Uh, let's, we do agree that those things were based on lies. It's most of our policies have been here. But at some point, even electorally, the Biden administration may come to the conclusion that this is not a, a winning play. If we let things take their natural course before November, 
if the Ukraine army collapses, that would be a catastrophic uh, issue for him. And it will almost certainly cost him the election anyway. So wouldn't it make sense for them to say, hey, let's let's you know, cut bait here and actually try to get this thing cut off. So it's at least our choice. Is that even a possibility? Actually, I think it is. Uh, I think that it's not impossible that within the next 60 to 90 days that Biden could suddenly resign and essentially take with him as he leaves office the principal burden of uh, guilt for this catastrophe, this fiasco. Now, that means that his vice president would step up to become president who would step in to be vice president? I have no idea, but I think that's a very real possibility. We shouldn't exclude it. There's been talk about it behind the scenes. Everyone well, in Europe behind the scenes in NATO knows the war is over. The people that refuse to admit this tragic truth uh, are the people at the top because they've hitched their wagon to us. They bet everything they have on the United States to pull this off. So Biden has to go. And I do not think he will be with us through the summer. I think at some point in the near future, he will simply resign and he'll take the blame or the fall for it. The other thing is, and I'm sure we're going to talk about this, the events in the Middle East are moving in new and different directions. Those events could actually converge with what's happening in Eastern Europe in ways that we haven't considered yet, making our position that much more unsustainable. Last question on this topic before we shift off to that, related to what you just said there about the uh, at least consideration among some in the Democratic Party to, to, to for Biden to acknowledge that and to seek a negotiated settlement. Given that, what do you think the chances are that when Congress comes back on the 9th of, of April, when the Speaker of the House, Johnson, said that they're going to take up a, a Ukraine funding bill, uh, do you think that's actually going to fly? Because it would seem to be a big, huge waste of money to allocate another $60 billion to something that's not even going to fly. Well, that depends, obviously, on the people that own uh, Speaker Johnson, his donors. Uh, I suspect that uh, it may be decided behind uh, closed doors that it's time to cut uh, the loss in Ukraine because it will become increasingly necessary for us to build up our position in the Middle East to prevent Israel from going under. I think Israel's in a very seriously weakened position right now, and there's a fear that we're so focused on Ukraine that Israel could suffer as a consequence. If that, in fact, comes to fruition, I think Johnson may change his tune and uh, be less willing to support the Ukrainian adventure than he is at the moment. But keep in mind, and this is something the Americans have never completely grasped, most of that money doesn't go to Ukraine. I mean, some of it obviously will to pay the army that is vanishing, to pay the bureaucracy that is collapsing, to pay Zelensky and, and the criminals in his regime who are profiting enormously from this. But the majority of the money will go into our defense industry to replace what's already been sent, to replace losses and fund a, a sort of reconstitution of our old outdated Cold War force structure. That's still important to Speaker Johnson because those people are also donors to his cause. So it's really, uh, it has nothing to do with what is in the interest of the American people, what is strategically important to the American people, and everything to do with Johnson and his friends and where their money comes from. I think we ought to just accept that's a reality. Yeah, but I guess we don't really have much of a choice to accept that. Even we would like it to be something different. It is what it is, and we have to deal with the reality we have. Well, I appreciate that, Doug, on all these things for, for the, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war. We're going to be seeing how all this plays out.